Welcome to Maximizing Your Potential with pastor and teacher Timothy Miller of White Dove Church. White Dove Church is located in the heart of Lafayette at 1400 West University Avenue with weekly service times every Sunday morning at 8 and 10.30 a.m. and a midweek service on Wednesday evenings at 6.30 p.m. Now let's join Pastor Timothy for another life-transforming word from God. That we look at the fact that there is a difference between nice and kind. There's a difference between, and in other words, the question is, are you nice or are you kind? And, you know, you always say, well, hey, you know, they're such nice people. They're such a nice couple. That's such a nice family. But we never say, well, that's a, that's a kind couple or that's a kind family. But we ought to change our vernacular because you need to understand there is a difference. And whenever I explain it to you, you'll see what I mean by that because when we deal with nice people versus kind people, what we're really dealing with is the fact that we are, again, a speaking spirit so we live according to different rules. Like the word love, for instance, and I told the, the church Wednesday night, you really ought to come on Wednesday night because uh, we really have a good time uh, if you ever can on a Wednesday night because we teach and then we're a little bit more relaxed. But I told the, the church Wednesday night, the word love, you know, if I say I love uh, pizza or I love Corvettes or I love to go fishing, you know, or I, I love the dog, or I, and I love my wife, well, you know, that love is not the same for all those people or all those things, you know. And it's on purpose that love is different, and it showed differently in different ways. And, of course, there's different forms of the word love. So you can get all trapped in that where if you're not careful, you're not functioning correctly in your love because you're misplacing your love. And so then you think you're doing one thing when you're actually doing something else. And so we too many times look at being nice or being kind as the same thing when in reality there's a big gulf between them. And so I want to explain that to you today as we look at Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, we're going to look at starting in verse 11. And we're going to just put some establishment here of why we do what we do. Uh, if you've been here more than, than once, you've heard me say that I made a deal when I came into the ministry as a pastor. The Lord says, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. Well, look, I can't build the church. It's not my job description. But my job description is right here. It says in Ephesians chapter 4, starting in verse 11. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors, and some teachers. I know a lot, there's a lot of folks that want to add to it, but there's only five. Okay, so this is it right here. Then verse 12 says, for the equipping of the saints, if you're a saint, say, I am. And so you are the ones to be equipped. And so that's why we're here, or one of the many reasons why we're here. That you would be equipped for what? The work of the ministry. So you might not be in the fivefold, but you are called to minister. Yeah. And so we have to get that understanding and that, and that distinction at the same time. And what is the reasoning but for the edifying of the body of Christ? What does Hebrews tell us? Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together for encouragement, for edification. So we have to understand that this goes hand in hand. Let's go to verse 13. It says, till we all come to the unity of the faith. Look at that word unity because we need unity. We have this unity many times in the church uh, universally, not in this church because we have a great family here and I'm proud of what God's doing in this house. But in the universal church, the church all across, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, it's very important that we deal with unity. It says, the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, verse 14, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men. Say the trickery of men. 
Discernment has never been more important because, again, I established in the beginning of the message, there's the fivefold ministry, and then there's the saints. But between that, there's folks that try to elevate themselves and add themselves into like they're a sixth gift or a sixth office. And then they think they're going to be able to tell somebody something, and they speak with forked tongue. Are you here? Yeah. So we go a little further. It says, in the cunning... A craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love is what we ought to be doing, uh, may grow up in all things into him who is the head Christ. Jump to verse 17. It says that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love, there's that agape, okay, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height, which is basically saying there is no measuring stick, okay? To know the love of Christ, it is insurmountable, it is unbelievably uh, unimaginable, the love of God, the love of Christ, which does what? Passes knowledge, passes understanding, passes the intellect of the soul that you may be filled with all the fullness of of God. And then, of course, our banner scripture that so many of us live by in the next verse, verse 20. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we would ask or think according to the power that works in us, to him be the glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Amen. That's our scripture reference that we're working with today. And so we're going to go to the Lord and ask him to be with us as we talk about this question, nice or kind? Father, we thank you, Lord, for the word that is already anointed, already appointed for the very moment that we are in, for the very people that are here. I pray, God, that your spirit will speak to spirits today. And we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. So again... Just because I like to rehearse a matter, I'm not going into a whole lot of review because you already know uh, a lot of these things, but I want to get to the heart of what I want to teach today. But for those of you that maybe this might be your first time or you might have missed a few messages, I'm going to catch you up. You are a speaking spirit and you have a soul and you live in a body. Amen. That's important for you to understand. But the problem that we're dealing with, and we're going to deal with it in detail today from another, another way, another, like an onion removing another layer, is this. We don't live like a spirit. We live our life. I, I never had nobody come and look. You know what happened? You know, we talked about love earlier, you know, and how love is, you know, love. Everybody's, you know, in love, you know, and all that type of thing, right? And, and so then they get married. And then they come to the altar. And in the, in the marriage ceremony, for better or for worse, for richer or for poorer, in sickness and in health. But when we counsel, we never counsel for the better. We never counsel for the richer. We never counsel for the health. It's always the sickness it's always the, 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 the poor. It's always the worse, right? Because that's what we're dealing with. But you know what? I ain't never counseled anybody because they made a bad decision when they were in the spirit. I never had no marriage counsel with anybody that came in and said, well, this happened because we were being in the spirit. So we don't live according to the Spirit. We live, come on, y'all better come to church now. We live according to the soul and that body area, that arena that gets us in trouble. So everybody in here has to understand that everybody in life has in their mind a war taking place minute by minute, by second by second. There went another one. There it went again. There it went again. Because why? Because the soul, which is your mind, your will, and your emotions, is the battleground of the enemy. Because the devil came, he can't fight your spirit. That's right. Because your spirit is saved, and that's it. Okay? So what does he do? He attacks you in your soul. He attacks you in your body. And so our life, and I've said this many times, our life is like a car on a journey. Pre-salvation, the spirit is locked in the trunk. The body, with its lazy behind, is laying in the back seat trying to sleep. 
and the soul is crazy driving up towards a cliff. Yeah, yeah. Then Jesus comes and saves you with the sirens, makes the car pull over, unlocks the trunk, let your spirit get out. Amen. And then your spirit gets in the front seat and pushes the soul over and says, now I'm going to drive. The problem come is when the spirit says, I'm tired, you drive for a little while, I'm taking a nap. And then while that spirit's sleeping, the soul and the body's making a, a mockery of your life. Are y'all here? Right. Yes. Why do I say that? Because, you know, we like to say, well, the devil made me do it. Well, we say that, and the devil says, I wasn't there. Because <laughs> some people don't need a devil. Are y'all here? man came down to the altar and said, Pastor, Pastor, would you pray for me? I think I got a devil. The devil spoke up, please, please, please deliver me from this evil. <laughs> what am I trying to say? We got to take personal responsibility. You can't blame the devil. You can't blame your life. You can't blame your parents. You can't blame the neighbor. You can't blame the mailman. You have to take personal responsibility for the quality of life that you are demonstrating to the world. Because when you got up this morning, you put your pants on, you put your shoes on, you, you, you did what you had to do to walk out the door and, and to accomplish what, wherever you are in this life and in this day. So the Bible tells us to back me up right here, Philippians 2, 12 and 13, work out your own salvation with fear and tremor. For it is the Lord who works in you both to will, desire, and to do good for his good pleasure. So, again, it's not about what's in your wallet. It's about what's in your mind. If you fix what's in your mind, your wallet will get fixed. If you fix what's in your mind, then you'll stop being sick. If you fix what's in your mind, you'll stop being broke. If you fix what's in your mind, you'll stop having marriage problems. If you fix what's in your mind, you'll stop being at war with everybody all the time and be able to live large and have some good relationships because that's what's wrong. It's the soul. It's the soul. So the quality of your life it's dependent upon the quality of your self-talk. And so whatever's going on in here, look, you want to know what somebody's thinking? Watch them. Some folks, look, you don't even have to say nothing to me. I know. I know what you're thinking because I watched you for five minutes. Because you're going to manifest. That self-talk is going to manifest. Well, I can do such and such. Yeah, but that's not what you're doing. What you're doing is this. So that's really what you're thinking. So if it doesn't work at home, don't export it. <clears throat> don't say that you can walk in a certain ability or gifting or you have knowledge in an arena in your life and you, know, you can't even manifest it and you're going to try to teach somebody else. So you got to deal with this thing about self-talk. See, no one can rise above their personal beliefs of possibilities and opportunities. Amen. So we come back to 1 Thessalonians uh, 5, 23. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, complete, whole, lacking nothing, standing before the Lord on the day of judgment, being able to, to say, I had congruency, I had everything in agreement, and everything was walking towards your purposes and your plans for my life. That your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. So internal communication and agreement between mind, body, and spirit must be in harmony and never in conflict. In other words, your soul has to become domesticated. You got to put a leash on that thing. You got to tell it, hey, like David said, go sit in the corner. You don't get an opinion today. Amen? So say with me and say, hey, nice or kind? So let's go to the scripture right here in Ephesians, back where we started, and, and look at these th two, three verses right here, Ephesians 3, 17, 18, and 19 and lay some groundwork for this deal about uh, the character of Christ. The Christ, Christ, Christ may dwell, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded, here's a key, in love, 
may be able to comprehend through the spirit, not comprehend through the soul, with all the saints, what is the width and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of Christ. So what are we doing today? We're doing Character of Christ 101 class today. That's what you came to, because I want you to understand this is important. That the character of Christ is important because it is the inward motivation. It is the spirit. It is the spirit. It is you as a spirit uh, being motivated to do and to say what is true as, as, in other words, what Jesus Christ would do in every situation. Remember those little bracelets back in the 80s and 90s? What would Jesus do? You know, folks didn't even go to church, didn't know who Jesus was, but they were, they were, they were stylish, right? That was the deal. So folks were wearing that. You know, what does that mean? Well, it's just a bracelet. Well, look, what would Jesus do should be every day when you get up, when you get ready to leave your house, before you do anything, what would Jesus do? In other words, you're being Jesus with skin on in all decisions, letting again, track with me, the spirit is driving the car. Because true godly character consists of the stable and distinctive qualities that have been transmuted into the heart that in turn will determine Christ-like responses regardless of the circumstances. You get a grape, you squeeze it, grape juice comes out of it, right? You get a lemon, you squeeze it, lemon juice comes out of it. You get a Christian that's being soulish and you squeeze it, God help us what's coming out of it. So you have to understand, it doesn't matter what's going on. Whatever the circumstances are, you have to know that true godly character, if it's alive in you, that's what's going to come out. That's what you see. When we talk about spirit control, somebody wants to really get on your bad side. Look, I'm in a place in my life right now where I can't afford to say what I really want to say. Because you can say it, and nobody's ever going to know. I'm going to say it, and KTC is going to be reporting it. <laughs> and so you have to be so cautious and careful. You have to be spirit controlled in every situation. They, they want to you know, run you off the road. Don't flip them off because you're going to see them in church next Sunday. They're going to look at you and say, is this seat taken? Oh, I remember you. And they're going to walk out the door. You have to be so careful. You have to be spirit controlled. Character is the spirit controlled inward response to difficult situations that no one observes. In other words, nobody's around. It's just you. And you think, well, well nobody's ever going to know. Right? Nobody ever find out. Right? Wrong. That's right. It always comes out. Yeah. Amen? So, in that moment, you have to stand in your spirit on a word from heaven, not a word from your soul that's whining and complaining and crying in the moment. Because when you whine, it ain't your spirit whining. Amen? And so you have to be cautious and careful that you start getting uh, depressed and emotional and upset and, and down in the dumps. Well, that's not the spirit. Amen? See, the Greek word for character in Scripture is actually translated as the express image of Jesus Christ. So how do we see that? Our witness should be an exact representation of our model, which is Jesus. So where do we get this understanding? The Bible says in Hebrews 1.3, who being the brightness of of his glory and the express image of his person, the character, and upholding all things by the word of his authority. We see this and understand that Paul, we believe it's Paul, shows us that Jesus Christ is referred to as the express image of God in the flesh. So what image are you and I mirroring every day? Because if you are going to be Jesus with skin on, if you're going to mirror Christ to people, are you going to mirror your flesh? Are you going to mirror your soul? Are you going to mirror, you know, Walmart, I've been in this line for 10 minutes. 
they need to hire some more people here. <laughs> What's wrong with this pig? I mean, come on, man. They, the, all these registers, they got 28 registers and three people working up in here. You know why you're laughing? Because I heard you. I heard you. By the time you get up there, that poor little girl that's got two or three kids of her own at home and she's trying to do what she can do to take care of her family, guess what? She catches it. She don't even make the schedule. That's right. That's right. And I'm going to, you know, y'all ought to have more people working in here. Poor little girl's like, yes, ma'am. Or, or yes, her. Or, or, or 498. Just whatever it takes to get you out of there, right? <laughs> See, 1 Corinthians 11, 1 tells us we ought to imitate. Paul says, imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. See, Paul uses the word imitate him as he imitates the Lord Jesus on the earth because there is a model. And he becomes the model and says, continue in this fashion. Let's model Christ. So whose disciple are you? You have, to, you have to answer that question because we somebody's disciple. See, Romans 6, 11 says, Likewise, you also reckon yourself. See, y'all thought reckon was just for Duck Dynasty, but it's in the Bible. <laughs> Likewise, you also reckon yourself to be dead. Indeed, to sin, but alive to God in Christ our Lord. See, we have a model. His name is Jesus, and we are supposed to be imitating him. And how do we do it? In three different ways. He said when he was out there and the devil was tempting him, in belief, number one, it is written. He established what he believed. It's the Bible. You're going to come challenge me, devil? I got a belief system. It's the Bible. We see in him passion. Don't pray for your passion to go. Keep your passion, but have righteous indignation. Jesus turned the tables up, cracked the whip, and said, my house will be a house of prayer. He didn't go in there and say, excuse me, guys. Um, could y'all please stop uh, doing this, please? This is not God. My father doesn't like this. Can, can we all just talk about this? Can we sit down, please? You know? No, he threw some tables up. He said, hey, get out. We said, Lord, please help me with my temper. No, you need to help yourself with your temper. The spirit controls the temper. And you, what does the Bible say? Be angry and sin not. So there ought to be a reason somewhere that we ought to have some anger. But it's called righteous in the nation. Are y'all here? And then, of course, syntax, where you say, well, uh, that's the way we do things. To say, oh, well, you know, uh, I don't know why they blessed. I don't know why they they doing what they, uh, I, well, why don't you ask them what they did? Because there's a process. You go to three different McDonald's, have the same sandwich, and have three different experiences, guess what? Somebody's not following the flow. It's pretty simple. Ketchup, onions, lettuce, a piece of meat, some buns, whatever, some cheese in there, whatever, you mayonnaise, whatever you like on that thing. But then you go to the next place, order the same thing, and you got all sorts of other stuff on it. Why? They're not following syntax. In the kingdom, there is a flow. And so you have to understand Jesus as our model showed us the flow. So if you want what he had, you want to do what he did, you want to have what the apostles had, you want to be able to do what they did, then follow the model. Are y'all here? Amen. So the question becomes, why is character so important? Well, character reveals the Lord Jesus Christ or the lack of him yes. since he is the full personification of godly qualities. Well, some people like to say, well, you know, that's, that's a good person because, you know, uh, he helped a little old lady across the street. Well, all he did was prevent murder. Are y'all here? He stopped vehicular manslaughter. He, he helped a little old lady across the street, but he doesn't have good character. We don't know if he does. Because the only place you find good character is if Jesus is inside of a person's life. That might be a good person, 
But we're not talking about the character of Christ. We're just talking about somebody did a nice thing. A nice thing. A nice thing. Not a kind thing. See, because when your spirit is in charge of your soul, heart character qualities will give emotionalized energy in praising and worshiping as a lifestyle. That's a long way of saying, you read a scripture, it stirs you up, that's emotionalized energy, and now it's an opportunity for a praise break. Are y'all here? That's what that is doing. It's fuel so that you can be able to give some glory to the Lord. And so we get all, man, I never saw it like that before. Man, I've read this scripture 400 times. I don't ever saw it like that before. Where did that come from? And we get all amped up, and that's emotionalized energy, and that's an opportunity for us to give God some praise. See, discerning character will help you to recognize the why in all things are working together for the good as conforming us to Christ. In other words... It happened to make you more like him. And we just so happy that we got through it. And we say, well, you know, it was such, such a bad deal. Man, but you know, the Bible says, man, all things work together for him that love, you know, for them that love. And so God's working it for my good. And we never ask ourselves, did God allow that to take place so you could change and become more like him, not just survive? But we just glad that we made it. Oh man, I survived that trial. I made it. Thank you, Lord Jesus. But God wants us to be more like Him. Yes. See, First John four, uh, verse one tells us, "Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test every spirit, whether they are of God or not, because many false prophets have gone out into the world." Now, false prophets are not just folks that wear nice dresses and nice suits and stand behind a podium. Sometimes false prophets live next door. Look, I know you're sitting next to your neighbor, but just don't make eye contact. <laughs> Sometimes false prophets are related to you. Because anybody that's speaking a word that is pulling you away from spirit life is a false prophet. 1 Thessalonians 5, 11 and 12 says, Therefore, encourage each other and edify one another, just as you are doing. And we urge you to recognize those who labor among you and are over in the Lord and warn you. So first of all, Paul says, Hey, make sure you know who you're with and make sure you are listening to who's trying to warn you about who you might be with. Amen. Because it's important to know who your enemies are, but it's more important to know who your friends are. Because you don't spend a lot of time with your enemies, but you spend a lot of time with your friends. And a lot of times your friends might become your frenemies. Are y'all here? Because birds of a feather will flop together. Now look, don't shout me down when I'm preaching good. I'm messing with your friends, but it's going to be all right. Because this message is not, gain, it's not geared towards any one person. This is a message to help all of us. I'm preaching this to me first. I have to be first partaker, so don't get nervous. I'm not gearing this towards any of you. But you've got to understand that there's a difference between being nice and being kind. Amen? And the scripture says in 1 Corinthians 13 that love is patient. And love is kind. Yeah. See, you heard the phrase, he or she is really a nice person. And you probably thought only positive about it. But the principle that most Christians miss is there's a difference between nice and kind as is it, there is a difference between soul and spirit. All right? I want to bring this home because there are distinctions in being purposely nice and being genuinely kind. Now hear how that's written. I'm going to purposely be nice, but I'm going to be genuinely kind. So there's energy and thought behind any acts of niceness, 
but it just flows when I'm being kind. See, kindness flows from where? Spiritual confidence in the Lord. Therefore, compassionate, uh, uh, being compassionate towards others, while at the same time comfortable with yourself, that's a spirit quality. When you flow in kindness, it's coming out of your spirit. And, and, and so you just flow in and you're compassionate and you're comfortable and you know who you are in Christ and you know where you stand and, 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 you're, and you're confident in the word and in the one that you have received. Are y'all here? The roots of niceness are inadequacy, a need for approval and for validation from, uh, from others, which is the soul. I want to do something nice, but I don't feel, I don't feel, I don't have my footing just right, and I want to be approved when I do it, you know, and I want to be validated when I do it, because I don't really know who I am. That's good. See, this is not about being codependent. Um, you know, this is not about uh, co codependent interaction, but rather this is about soul versus spirit and motivation of believers. We're not talking about people that are not saved. We're talking about believers, people that are saved, but their motivation is questionable when they're trying to do something to exalt self. I'll give you an example. Many years ago, I was preaching for Pastor Mike one night. He couldn't make it to the service, and he asked that if I would fill in. And so I was uh, trying to type a message real quick because the service started at 6 o'clock, and I found out somewhere around 5, 5.30, that he wasn't coming. So I said, okay, Lord, I need a message. So I'm trying to get my message together and get organized to, to preach, and the printer broke. So then I went to the church that we were renting at the time, because this was way back whenever uh, Lafayette, uh, White Dove Lafayette was in infancy, and we were renting another facility, using it on a Saturday night. And so I went there, long story short, asked the people that we were renting the building from, not White Dove people, I asked the people there, hey, can I just use one of your office computers? I need to print something. Did that. Then we go home, and on the front step of our house is a brand new printer in a box. <laughs> so we didn't tell nobody. We didn't advertise. We didn't put it on Facebook. Come on, somebody. And to this day, almost 10 years later, I don't know where that printer came from. Amen. And you know why? Because the person that put it on my step operated in kindness, not niceness. Because nice people want you to know. I'm going to get to heaven and find out who gave me that printer. <laughs> See, 1 Corinthians 12 12, 13, and 14 says, For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by the Spirit we were baptized into one body. For in fact the body is not one member but many. Look at that baptized into. Y'all know pickles? Well, pickles, you know, uh, you, you like to get some pickles. And actually, baptism or being baptized, th that word is pickled. So, y'all know the juice that the pickles are in? That's the real deal. It's not about the pickle because it's the juice that makes the pickle. So, how many of y'all being pickled with the wrong kind of juice? Because we've all been baptized or pickled into one body. So that means we're going to have the flavor and the scent of the folks we have been baptized together with. Just a thought. See, kindness is a strong internal re uh, reference point in trusting of Christ's approval. 
So when I do something from a place of kindness, from my spirit, I have an internal reference point that I know who I am in Christ. I don't need a pat on the back. I don't need you to tell an attaboy. I don't need nobody to tell me thank you. If the Holy Spirit tells me to do it, I'm going to do it. And I feel strong in who I am. And nobody ever needs to know because I know he knows. Amen. But niceness is a strong uh, external reference point in which we're seeking for others' approval from our soul. Overly nice people try to please others to feel good about themselves. Can I do that for you? I want to do that for you. Please let me do that for you. You need my help. Let me do that for you. I want to do that for you. Oh, come on. You know. And it's just, it's just overkill. Genuinely kind people try to bless others to show God's goodness. They don't want to be seen. They want him to be seen. Amen. They don't want to be heard. They want him to be heard. Are y'all tracking? Amen. We're still dealing with this spirit and soul and body thing, but we're trying to learn this morning how to function correctly with the character of Christ from our spirit in everyday living. Are y'all all right? Yeah. So being nice becomes, if I'm good to you, maybe you'll validate me as a good person in return. I do good for you, you do good for me. When I was in a certain organization back in the day, in the early days of my ministry, I preached for you, you preached for me, we trade. It was never just one good turn and that's it. It's one good turn and there needs to be another. Yeah. You scratch my back, I scratch yours. It's a trade, it's an exchange. It's, nothing, it's just never something for nothing. Yeah. Yeah. And in the kingdom, it's always something for nothing. Yeah. He went to the cross gave his life for us. Yes. Not a good trade on heaven's part. Are y'all here? Right. Right. Amen. They gave everything. God the Father, the Son. Jesus came and gave everything and got us. Yeah. <laughs> you understand? Now we made righteous through him so there's no condemnation but pre-Christ it was kind of like not really a great deal. Are y'all here? Right. See, genuinely kind people display uh, giving God's nature to others. So they have God's nature on display and they're giving people and you see, you almost can feel the heartbeat of the Lord and you can almost feel the touch of the Lord uh, and you sense His presence and, you've, and you don't sense, you don't, you don't feel violated, you don't feel weirded out, you don't feel uncomfortable, you feel like, like the hand of the Lord touches you. Because they're so giving, and so they just, they want to remove themselves, that's literally being Jesus with skin on, being his hands and his feet. That's what, when you go on a missions trip, and you minister to those little children, and you're there just to love on those children, they feel and sense the literal touch of heaven yes. when you do it from the right place. Because you are, you are God with skin on to them. Yes. Amen? Right. Kind people will take personal responsibility for believing God to give identity, to give value, to give purpose, and to give fellowship. They aren't looking for any kind of fellowship or purpose or identity or value from anybody but God. And then God brings everything else for them because they trust him. But nice people will create a vicious cycle by overly investing in activities to please and care for others, trying to satisfy their personal needs. So let's have an activity, right? Let's have a Mary Kay party, or let's get together and have a this party or that party. Because why? Because we need to feel good about ourselves, but we're going to mask it by inviting everybody to come over. Because I want to do something good for you, but really I want to do something good for me. <laughs> let's go out to the restaurant and have a get together, because I want to do something good for you, when really I want you to, when you walk out the door and say, this was wonderful, I'm so glad you planned it. Hello? See, that's, that's soulish behavior. And you have to be careful with this because people pleasers need other people 
to compensate for an emptiness that only the Holy Spirit can fill. I told the people at 8 o'clock, and I'm going to tell you, give me a cup of coffee, let me heat. Me and my wife sit on the back porch with my kids and my grandkids. Look, my daughter was in her hammock with, with her little Bible yesterday morning in her hammock out there in the backyard. My son and my grandkids were playing on the trampoline and running around. You give me that and a cup of coffee with my wife, and I don't ever have to see nobody else ever again. Because my fulfillment comes from God and from those he's given me. Yes. I can't be fulfilled by you and you can't be fulfilled by me. Are y'all here? Amen. You got to get this today because nice people create a struggle for events to make their emptiness bearable. Let's get together. Uh, let's get together. It's time for another get together. Let's get together. It's time for another get together. To hell with that. I don't want no more get-togethers. Get together. We're going to get together and we're going to catch something. Get an STD, a spiritually transmitted disease. Are y'all here? You got to be careful. You got to be careful who you're hanging out with because who you're hanging out Look, again, who you're hanging out with is defining who you are. You got a crazy friend? Guess what people think about you? This message is going so well today. <laughs> Psalm 1611 says, You show me the path of full life in your presence. Here's the answer. It's in your presence that there's fullness of joy. Hallelujah. At your right hand are pleasures forever. It's in the presence of the Lord that you should find your fulfillment. Hallelujah. Look, I believe in fellowship, but not as a replacement. So don't get weird on me. I'm not preaching some kind of thing where I don't believe we ought to fellowship. We need to fellowship, but not as a replacement for you being able to find who you are in his presence. Listen, we talk about love. I said it a little while ago. Love's a wonderful thing, but ain't nobody stays married for 25, 30 years because they loved each other. See, the married people that's been married for a while, they're laughing. The young people looking around saying, oh, we love each other. <laughs> Talk to me about 15 years. <laughs> we love each other. No, see, spirit commitment is why you stay married, not because of love. Love's a wonderful thing, but that's not the only thing that's going to keep a person married to another person. Because soulish desires come and go, but spirit-controlled lifestyle where you've made a commitment to walk together and it's the spirit that connects the man and the woman that they're one flesh in the sight of the Lord, not because, you know, I love you, I love you. I told the people Wednesday night, you meet a person, you have butterflies. After you've been married a while, they become bats. So y'all here? <laughs> <laughs> Woo! Look at the married folks. <laughs> One of them whispered to the other, man, I just got delivered. <laughs> because it's about being spirit controlled. Love is a choice. That's right. That's right. But being spirit controlled is a lifestyle. Are y'all here? Right. See, kind people. Add to their already fulfillment through giving and serving others. Amen. Already fulfilled. I don't need right. you to fulfill me. Right. I've got my life with the Lord. Look, I'm saved. I'm in the ministry. This is what I do. This is who I am. This is the rest of my life. My wife is the same way. We would do this whether or not something would happen that we would, you know, whatever would happen if we wouldn't have been together, we still would do this because we are sure in who we are in our relationship with Jesus. The beautiful thing is we get to do it together, 
But that's after. Our relationship with the Lord is first, then us. See, nice people can't realize self-worth and their life quality will never be improved by being a people pleaser. I tell the young singles that when they talk to me sometimes, I say, listen, you know what the best thing you could ever do? Is get your life in a perfect uh, place of fulfillment with the Lord where you don't need nobody else, where you complete lacking nothing, you and Jesus, and then you meet that significant other, and then that's law y'all. That's just a blessing for the rest of your life, but you're fulfilled because you have him. Go into that dating relationship already fulfilled and married to Jesus so that you don't have to go into that situation and, and you looking for them to make you happy and fulfilled. Yes. See, becoming a, a people pleaser to get attention, validation, and approval tends to backfire with being seen as a needy and a manipulative individual. Man. Man. It's like every time I turn around, this person's always looking for, they're looking, they're pulling on me, they're draining on me. And that person don't know you're talking about them. Don't look at them. And so they, they want approval. Uh, they, 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 uh, can you validate me? You see what I did? Hey, you see what I did? Look, 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 look at me. Hey, 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 hey. You see me? Can you see me? Can you see me? Look, look, can you see me? That's what they're doing. And so after a while, you kind of try to pretend like you don't know them anymore. <laughs> See, Isaiah chapter 30, verse 15 says, In still quietness, with confidence, shall be your strength. Amen. Be still and know that I am God. Amen. Have all my hope is in you. Amen. My trust is my foundation, my security, that I can know that with quietness that I, I'm still in his presence and that the confidence I have comes from the fact that he is my strength, he is my all in all, and it is in him that I put everything, everything I have, everything I hope to be. So the question is, how can, a, uh, how can we become kind, uh, caring persons without becoming people pleasers because we want to care for people we want to be kind we want to have love because uh, the Bible says that, we'll, that they're going to know we're his disciples by our love for one another so how do, we, how do we pull this off well the answer is in a decisive shift of intention it's all about our intentions because we like to defend well you know my intention was, well, yeah, that's wonderful, but where was your intention coming from? Because you have to have a decisive shift of intention from looking outside yourself for an emotional need to be met to looking inside to Jesus Christ where your needs are already met. And so, you know, we want to have the get-togethers and the oil of essence parties or whatever that stuff is. And, you know, what is it, that stuff? Essential oil. Essential oil. Yeah. Y'all can tell how many parties I went to. And you do all that stuff, and there ain't nothing wrong with the oils. Do the oils. Do the oils all you want to do. But don't utilize that as a tool or something like that as a tool because you need your emotional needs met and it's a way to draw people towards you. Amen. Hebrews 12 verses 2 and 3 says, Looking unto Jesus, here's where our focus needs to be, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, lest you become weary and discouraged in your soul. Why? Because you looked everywhere else but Jesus. Because you're looking at everybody else but Jesus. Because you're waiting for somebody else to say please and thank you and, and, and good job and, uh, and you're such a blessing and I appreciate you so much and man, you're awesome and you, you're so smart and you're so good looking and you're so wonderful and you so and you so and you so and you so. Man, look to Jesus. He loved you enough. He got on the cross and saved your skanky behind from hell. You ought to give him some glory and some praise and some thanksgiving. And stop worrying about those other people because people 
man, personalities are selective, man. They come and they go, and, 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 and you catch somebody on a bad day, and oh, my God, oh, Lord, what just happened? Oh, man, wow, wow. You know, you catch them on a good day, and it's like, well, then they're running all over you. You know, you just don't know. They're going to be happy one minute and sad the next minute, and they're going to want to be with you for the rest of your life, and they want to disown you the next minute. And that's just the folks you live with. <laughs> So as the church, who are we called to be lifting up? Look, John chapter 12, verse 32. And if I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. He didn't say draw people to you or to me. So we need to get out of this mindset that we're trying to pull our group. We want to get our posse, get our peeps, get our folks together, and create this little deal and this little dynamic. And because what he says, lift me up. Amen. And let folks be drawn towards me. See, we must make Christ's approval the enablement of our spirit to be kind for Christ's sake. So you need some fuel, you need some juice, you need something to enable you towards success. Let Christ's approval be that fuel that will push your spirit that you would be kind one to another for the sake of Christ. Amen. For the sake of Christ, not you, because Galatians 2.20, I no longer live. Some Christians don't want to read that scripture. I no longer live means I no longer live. But Christ lives. So why am I worrying about my needs if I no longer live? Hello? <laughs> so we have to look at this and we have to understand that Ephesians 4.32 says, And be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God and Christ forgave you. We don't have no forgiveness for nobody. You do me wrong, you, I don't know you no more. You do me wrong, it's over. Forget about it, it's over. I don't know you. Swim with the fishes. It's over, right? Yeah. Colossians 3.23 says, In whatever you do, do it wholeheartedly as unto the Lord and not unto people. Yeah. You, don't need a, 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 you don't need to go Facebook Live we're Facebook Live. We're going in to feed the homeless. Watch us as we do this. No, no, no. no. Watch real carefully. Here comes, look, there's a homeless man. Watch. We're giving him two scoops of soup. Watch what's going to happen now. Track with us. Watch. We don't do it as unto somebody else's pat on the back. We do it as unto the Lord. If you're not careful when you get to heaven and all that foolishness burns up, there ain't going to be nothing there for you. Ephesians 6, 5 says, In sincerity of heart, as to Christ, not with eye service as people pleasers, but as servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with good will doing service, as to the Lord, and not to or for people. Amen? This is important, because nice folks want to be seen, but kind folks want him to be seen. The impossibility of true character is, it's only, is that it's only by grace and growth can we gain the power of genuine love. You do something for a little while and you lose your grace. We used to drive a lot. In the early years, I used to drive a lot. We just drove all over the place. One time, whenever we had a traveling worship team and we did different stuff, we did 33 services in 30 days. And guess what? I don't have the grace for that no more. <laughs> that season has passed. That ship has sailed. But you know what? When you find that the grace is gone, it's because God is preparing you for your next season, and there'll be grace for that next season. I used to drive a lot. 
in between here in New Orleans and all over the place in Mississippi doing different things for White Dove. And then the grace kind of began to shift. And God began to put it in us that we needed to put an anchor. And when that, when that changed, I remember, I used to drive all the time, and it was no big deal. And then one day I looked at my wife and said, oh, I don't want to drive this no more. Yeah. And the grace had left. So when the grace is there, then there's a power for genuine love to be doing what you're doing in the season in which you're doing it for the people that you're doing it for. If you don't have grace for children, don't teach children's church. Because we want our children to come home with us the same way we dropped them off. Are y'all here? As I learned a long time ago, people say, well, what do you need? You, you need some help in children's church? Yeah, are you called today? No, but I mean, I'll help out if y'all need me. Never mind. You scaring me. Those little children are going to be petrified. They're going to be terrified. Are y'all here? See, it begins with becoming spirit-controlled with the times of testings. That will come. And it is a process of walking in the spirit. How do we become spirit controlled? You got to know how to control your spirit. How do you control your spirit? The tests are going to come. Somebody gets you mad. Something bad happens. Something happens where you get disappointed. Something, somebody attacks you. Something that you've been believing for and it it doesn't turn out the way you want. How are you going to respond? And like I told you at the beginning of the message, I don't have the ability to do or say what I really want to say. I have to be spirit controlled. People get on my last nerve. I have to find another one. One, I have to manifest a new nerve because I can't let them see what I really want to say or hear what I really want to say or do what I really want to do because I can't lose the control over my spirit that my spirit be able to what? Control my soul, control my body, and be Jesus with skin on so that he can be glorified. Every character quality is an expression of genuine love which exposes our self-focus. So again, you want to find out who somebody is and what they're all about? Then you're going to see through their character quality because then genuine love comes to the surface. Then you see that their self-focus is not about them but rather Jesus or the latter uh, issue that we spoke about which could be maybe they are their, their own issue. Uh, last scripture, John 3, verse 30. He must become greater and greater, and I must become less and less. Now, I've heard this scripture misquoted for years that, you know, we need to become less so that he can become greater, and that's the way it's supposed to work, that we have to become less so he can become greater. The problem with that is that's the, mis- that's the misunderstanding of the Bible that, well, let me get my life right and then I'll come be saved. No, you come get saved just as you are. So what do we do? If you let him become bigger and he's the focus, then by default you are no longer the focus. He begins to fill the rooms of your life and begins to take over the, the rooms of your heart Because you gave him authority, you didn't come and become a God to yourself that you can fix everything and then add him to it. So the last word today is that we must be willing to give and serve for Christ's sake and not for our personal gain so that we can be elevated, that we can have a title, so we can have a position that feels like somebody that we're not because his spirit must increase and our soulish motives decrease. Church is a place. Church is where. Where we meet as a body of believers to worship collectively. To be closer to God for his kingdom. Believers come together in a corporate setting. You can come and not worry about people judging because we're all doing the same thing. It's a place where we learn that we will spend eternity in heaven. Where you can lean on somebody. We learn about the way Christ walked the earth. And the Lord shows up in, in a mighty way. We are your church. 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 
Don't you think it's time to come be a part of your church? I'm Timothy Miller, pastor of White Dove Church here in Lafayette. I pray that the broadcast has been a blessing to you today. We'd love to have you come and be with us in one of our live services here real soon. We meet every Sunday morning at 8 a.m. and 10.30 a.m. and every Wednesday evening at 6.30 p.m. We're located on the corner of Congress and University at 1400 West University Avenue. We love you. We hope to see you soon. If you come worship with us, I promise you, you'll be glad you did. God bless you.